it's an incredibly difficult journey, I think, that entails an enormous amount of suffering. But you arrive at this point, which Camus, I think, think puts best at the end of the myth of Sisyphus when he writes, uh, the struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. That, that's the key. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. That speaks to the kind of work that you and, and Connie especially does, I think, with transplanting those trees you were talking about. It can seem so futile in the face of our own mortality and the collapsing biosphere, et cetera, but it's not. The struggle itself towards the heights is enough. Uh, we have to imagine ourselves happy. I spent some time with a pastor at a church camp studying uh, the Nicene Creed and other things. And I thought this is not, this bears no resemblance to my, to what the so-called religious folks around me are doing and thinking. And I'm not going to countenance it any longer. So turned against that, turned against a series of things that led me to becoming, which I had always already been, what I later learned uh, in my philosophical studies, the ancient Greeks called atapos, uh, which just means out of place. People who have a, a post, this post-doom perspective are living what is sometimes called an ironic existence, I think. And like we have to, we have to sort of go about our daily business in a, in a world that, in which we do not fit. So harken back to what I was saying about being out of place or octopus. And there, that, that experience, that daily lived experience is, is just rife with ironic joy. Well, Rory, it has been a long time coming that I've been looking forward to this conversation with you. What was the title of that piece that you wrote that was one of the best popularizations or, uh, you know, putting forward William Catton's work? What was that titled? Yeah, I had titled it, We Are the Threat, Reflections on Near-Term Human Extinction. That's when you showed up on my radar and it's like, oh, well, who is this young guy that's able to speak this kind of stuff? Since then, there really has been, I mean, it's like you are probably now, at least for some, perceived as a prophet, as someone who sees what's coming and then speaks boldly or straight about it. That experience has been rewarding for me, too, because I did very much feel alone. For our, when I first started speaking out about these things, uh, because there was such minimal awareness, although writing that piece, which I wrote almost exactly or published almost exactly two years ago now, um, helped me to connect with uh, folks online that were already thinking and writing about these types of things. Uh, Extinction Radio through Mike uh, Berrigan and Jennifer Hines was one of the first ones, you know, and, and from there I connected with you and et cetera, et cetera. So that has been rewarding. And one of the best compliments I've gotten here at Columbia has come from a fellow doctoral student in my program who is a, a, an Abyssinian, he's a, he's a preacher at an Abyssinian Baptist church. And he did call me a prophet. And I was like, all right, you know, I'm, yeah. uh, I'm succeeding to some extent. What I'd like to do at the start is just, you know, for people who aren't familiar with you, they've never read anything you've written or they don't know about you or anything else. Help us get you, like, like uh, for anybody watching or listening to this, help us know sort of who Rory Verado is, what you're passionate about, what you're known for, whatever. And just feel free to take time to help us get you. Sure, yeah. I mean, we can speak at length about that or we can do the abridged version. I, I can tell you up front, you know, that I'm a, currently a PhD student in the philosophy and education program at Teachers College uh, of Columbia University here in New York City. But that's certainly not where I started. Uh, I grew up in rural Western Pennsylvania, small town of about 3,500, maybe 4,000 people. Um, sometimes I'll describe it as my childhood as having been something like a, an 18 year long open air Trump rally. Uh, so <laughs> I, uh, I, I sort of escaped from that. And maybe we can circle back and talk about the way that, that my childhood I think has influenced me um, in order to perceive things differently than others. But I escaped that uh, through a combination of luck and skill uh, and received a, a full scholarship to Arizona State University. So I transplanted out west. Um, and there I studied American history. Uh, 
And for me, I guess the, maybe the single sort of the overarching theme here was that I, I just became increasingly radicalized the more I learned about especially the history of this country and the political history of this country. So I had already been inclined to see things differently. I was anti-authoritarian. And then I realized, uh, you know, that the United States in many ways, we are the bad guys, right? So my, my paper uh, that you encountered, my essay was, we are the threat. And taking that critical stance, recognizing that maybe the way we think about ourselves is not actually accurate, I think it began for me at this, at this juncture. So at any rate, I'm studying American history, took some time off. Uh, from school, worked for vitamin water of all places uh, for a couple of years. <laughs> and then and then I was like, okay, this isn't working for me. You know, I, I need to go back and study some more. <laughs> I went back to ASU and I, I got a master's in political theory because during my undergraduate studies, I had met uh, an amazing individual who's enormously influential to me by the name of Jack Crittenden, who's a 30 year long friend with Ken Wilbur. Uh, and, and of course, an academic in his own right. We can talk about some of that. Anyway, I, I happened to take a course with him during my undergrad, reconnected. I reconnected with him for my master's in political theory, studied with him for a couple of years. And then, uh, then I taught high school, actually, for a couple of years after that. And then after doing that for a little while, I realized, and this was sort of the transition point, I realized during my master's studies, that the things I cared about politically uh, were never going to come about, if they could indeed come about at all, by any means other than education. In other words, I, I wanted to transition to education because I saw that, that radicalization, which is what I felt like we needed and still need, is just not going to come at the ballot box and you know these types of things. So conventional political activity. Transition to education, got some hands-on education experience, and then from there bounced here to New York City in my current program. So that's that's a little uh, heavily focused on the academic side of things, but I am an aspiring academic, and so that's important uh, to who I am. Yeah. What what's your what's your thesis, or what do you imagine your the you know your doctoral dissertation being? I have something very firmly in mind that I need to flesh out to book length, uh, and I haven't actually even published anything yet with this specific concept so you're getting sort of the cutting edge of of my thinking here um but i will be writing about this soon anyway my the concept that i want to explore and, and develop and articulate is what i call mortal foresight and i take that from uh a play by aeschylus prometheus bound and there's a a, a line in the play uh that goes like this uh, men's doom from mortal foresight i kept hid I sowed within them sightless hopes, blind hopes. So what does that mean? Well, the sort of the, ex, the explication of that is what I want to do uh, in my dissertation, connecting it with the Anthropocene and the conditions on the what Gatton calls the current human situation on Earth. So in my view, mortal foresight is this ability that we all have, but that for various reasons we are not able to tap into of recognizing our own mortality, truly understanding uh, that we're going to die, and then, and then taking that next step and linking our mortality at the individual personal level to uh, the collective uh, species level, the possibility of human extinction and, and species mortality, for lack of a better term. So really uh, uh, working through that concept and then the subtitle I have in mind is learning to live through extinction because even if there is total human extinction which i personally think is unlikely i think it's more like an approximation of extinction uh, a close approximation of extinction uh, we still have to people are going to live through that process they're going to live through their death <laughs> they're going to live through extinction and we have to learn literally have to learn how to do that or else we're just going to keel over and die yeah. Uh, which I think, unfortunately, many people will do. You, you're you're perfectly familiar with the phenomenon of overshoots and what happens to species populations that are confronted with those conditions. Yeah. It's a sudden death, oftentimes, yeah. for many of the members. So, anyway, that's that's the premise of the dissertation and what I'm working on right now. 
there are ways of holding our own and our species mortality that are disempowering, profoundly disempowering. And there are ways of holding mortality, impermanence, and death that can be profoundly inspiring and helpful. And a lot of people don't know that. They don't, they're not aware that there are different ways to hold that and that indigenous cultures, for example, most, can't say it all, but the vast majority in terms of all the anthropological evidence that we have over the last five, 600 years suggests, as Stephen Jenkinson talks about quite a bit, that, um, that most indigenous cultures, most pro-future cultures, most what we would call sustainable, that is cultures that could live in place without destroying the place and, and without, right. uh, without overshoot, um, they saw themselves continuous with time and space. And was their identity didn't stop with the skin or didn't stop with our tribe, but they knew that they were part of the ancestors and they would soon be they would soon themselves be an ancestor when they died. They just didn't go away. They were consulted as an ancestor uh, as in the same way that they consulted their ancestors, imaginatively, of course. Um, and there was also that sense of continuity with that their, their, their larger body was the biosphere, was the cosmos. So there was not that sense of fear of death that Ernst Becker and, and, uh, and others talk about, you know, the denial of death and all of this assumption really based on a Western individualistic mindset that, you know, people universally are afraid of death. Well, no, that's actually not historically accurate and it's not psychologically <laughs> accurate. Um, so at any rate, so anything you want to say, uh, that's sort of my own shtick, but anything you want to say <laughs> about, mort Im uh, about uh, impermanence, about mortality, about death, and how do you hold it in ways that you find helpful? Well, I mean, we could talk for, for a long time about just those topics, I think. Uh, you know, one of the things you said that, that struck me is, is that there are sort of better and worse ways of, of holding that idea. And I think for me, certainly as part of my personal journey, and I think this is common for many folks uh, who are sort of collapse aware, so to speak, is, uh, is a confrontation with nihilism, right? So nihilism, I think a nihilistic uh, view is, is, a, is a worse way of confronting one's mortality. And I had the good fortune or bad luck, depending on how you look at it, to, to sort of <laughs> wrestle with, with that very early in my life. I, uh, I had a very unhappy childhood. Um, I had uh, my parents divorced when I was less than two years old, extremely acrimonious divorce, um, lots of emotional and, and psychological, psychological trauma from that uh, for myself. And by the time I was uh, like approaching my early teens, I was in a pretty bad spot. And I just so happened to come across and fall into basically existentialism at that time. Uh, and it's interesting how things work. I can remember, I can trace exactly what happened. I, I had been into uh, video games as a form of escapism, largely, yeah. I think. And there was a video game that I played that was called Beyond Good and Evil. And I thought, this is an interesting title. I'm going to look this up. This led me to Nietzsche, <laughs> right? So I'm like right, 13, exactly, of course. 14, year, <laughs> 13, 14 years old or something. And I see, okay, Beyond Good and Evil comes from this old book. And I, had, I was all, already reading crazy shit, you know, because uh, I, I love to read. And I had read The Lord of the Rings and other fantasy epics, what a sci-fi, H.P. Lovecraft, just crazy shit. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so I found Nietzsche and I read not Beyond Good and Evil first, because it was too expensive at Barnes and Noble, which I <laughs> so I got thus spoke Zarathustra, which I found out later is arguably a much more difficult text. I found it uh, just it just I just entered right into it. It spoke to me, and and that was at my my entry point into thinking deeply and and uh, uh, somewhat systematically about issues of mortality uh, and, and and nihilism. So. This was what I discovered was a cure for nihilism. Nietzsche is often, well, widely misunderstood in many ways, but most often misunderstood as a nihilist. He's not a nihilist. He's an anti-nihilist, if anything. Uh, he's all about embracing the joy of life. He has a doctrine called amor fati, love your fate. Uh, more and more, he says, I want to see as beautiful what is necessary in things. Yes, yes. 
then I will be one of those as makes things beautiful. He says that in the gay science, but that theme runs through his, his entire au revoir. And anyway, that spoke to me at a deep, deep, deep level. That's the reason that I am where I am and who I am doing what I'm doing today was my encounter with that. So that was the beginning of what Nietzsche would call my convalescence. Uh, my convalescence from a place of nihilism to an eventual place of embrace. And that, that journey is possible for anyone, I think. I don't know if it's possible for the entire species. I like to think that it could be. If it's, if it's possible for every individual, why couldn't it be possible for all persons? But then I wonder that we have to become something other than what we are in order to make that happen. Yeah. Then we get into the, you know, the consciousness evolutions that many others have thought about in other, in other ways. But that, that for me is a, a healthier way of grappling with these types of topics, which is not to say that it's an easy one. It's an incredibly difficult journey, I think, that entails an enormous amount of suffering. But you arrive at this point, which Camus, I think, think puts best at the end of the myth of Sisyphus when he writes, uh, the struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. That, that's the key. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. That speaks to the kind of work that you and, and Connie especially does, I think, with transplanting those trees you were talking about. It can seem so futile in the face of our own mortality and the collapsing biosphere, et cetera, but it's not. The struggle itself towards the heights is enough. Uh, we have to imagine ourselves happy. Yeah. Rory, one of the questions that I have been asking various guests in this series that I really would love to have your perspective on, because I know you teach on the philosophy of human nature. So um, it's related to human nature. So I'll just read it the way that Connie wrote the question, uh, because there's a lot there. How does your sense of inborn human strengths and limitations affect your interpretation of our societal and cultural deterioration? That is, could this descent have been avoided? Or do you think that it was in some ways inevitable? Or maybe you view this kind of if only speculation as being irrelevant now or even a waste of emotional energy? Yeah, uh, just wanna mention to folks, I do teach philosophy of human nature at, at Fordham here in the city. That being said, I don't consider myself an expert on it. I think anybody who claims to be an expert or to have the answer of human nature is fundamentally mistaken to begin with. Walk so, out of the room if they claim that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so with that sort of caveat or, or preface in mind, um, I, personally, I think of uh, human nature as being uh, deeply, deeply creative sort of creative all the way down, insofar as there almost is no um, inborn, inborn limitations, I think was the phrasing of the question or something, inborn or even inborn abilities. I think at the deepest level, it's, uh, it's, a, it's in a creative emergence of novelty uh, throughout evolutionary history and that you can extend that to life itself, but also as it is instantiated in, in we humans. Um, so I like to think of human nature as consisting in a set of potentialities. Uh, uh, and even to say something like a set is, is not quite right because it suggests that it's determined or constrained or finite or that this set is identifiable. But, but rather, I think of it as sort of the interaction between whatever humans are, including in our biological capacity and what we now call psychological consciousness broadly construed, the interaction between that phenomenon and what we take to be depending on our own human nature as separate from us. So material conditions, we might say. This dialectical relationship and here I'm influenced in large part by Marx uh, and others who suggest that there is this sort of dance, this back and forth between whatever humans are, whatever we're doing, and the things that we're doing it with or to, the action. So it's fundamentally process-based also. 
what I take human nature to be. And, you know, Marx has this line, I think I can paraphrase from the preface to his critique on political economy, where he says, it is not the consciousness of men that determines their social conditions, but rather their social conditions that determine man's consciousness. Now that's a little too narrow in my view, but I like the spirit of it yeah. because it shows that we don't bring a, a, a preset uh, human nature to our circumstances. Rather, it really is that our, our human nature is almost introjected into us by our interactive relationship with our surroundings, including other persons and other forms of life. Uh, and for me, this is borne out in the way that consciousness, again, broadly construed, has changed over time. You mentioned the axial age earlier in our conversation, and I, I like, I think there's something special about that period of time when Socrates, uh, Buddha, and I think Zoroaster were all alive at once. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and the emergence of money and, co and things like that, that shows that there is this broad, like, a sort of a crashing wave or a thrust of the evolution of human nature that is so far beyond our understanding, let alone our sort of capacity to direct it. And we have to keep that in mind, too, as we're, as we're thinking about what we might be both individually and collectively. Let me jump in with one thing, which is that it seems to me as I read, you know, just even the concept of human nature, ultimately human nature is a part of nature, nature that, you know, that, that our consciousness as well as our bodies were emergent out of the body of life. Um, and it seems to me that there's a fundamental difference between human nature in cultures that are experiencing carrying capacity surplus and human nature as it shows up in cultures that are experiencing carrying capacity deficit. Mm -hmm. Said another way, human nature in pro-future cultures, more or less sustainable, and human nature in anti-future cultures or those that are more or less unsustainable. So anything you want to say about that, because I think that's pretty important, but you, you may have a different perspective. No, I mean, I think that I think that's probably right. And it certainly dovetails at least into the sort of conceptualizing that I'm offering here as as what might be my own view, which is that our circumstances deeply influence and affect what we think of as our human nature. So you mentioned the pro future societies that, uh, you know, are not exceeding carrying capacity. Well, those circumstances, those material conditions and uh, et cetera, et cetera, are, are qualitatively distinct from those that exist in other circumstances in, in, in which we might call those societies anti-future or uh, existing in conditions of overshoot. So I think that's right on its face as far as it goes. The question for me would then be, to what extent can we think of certain qualities of human nature as being malleable as a result of those different circumstances and perhaps others as as being untouched by them yeah. it might be the case that they're all malleable but it might be the case that only some are yeah i don't i don't have a definitive answer on that but i do think and i know and i i, I firmly believe that certainly in contemporary western american petrocapitalism uh and really really just yeah we'll say we'll go with petrocapitalism but capitalism in general, uh, there has been a, a, a almost a strong determination of human nature for the average person, certainly for the proletariat, for the working class. That is, and what I mean by that is that there, the the constraints on what a working class person can be are so tight uh, as a result of their material conditions and. Uh, very rigid hierarchical human uh, relationships, what Marx calls the social relations of production under capitalism, such that we have in the United States, I think this is still true, what uh, C.B. McPherson, the Canadian political theorist, calls uh, possessive individualism. That is, that is almost what I think uh, is the default human nature uh, for many people in the United States and, and really globally under global capitalism. 
obsessive individualism, which is to say that we take ourselves to be skin bound selves, yeah. as Alan Watts says, and these selves are proprietors. We are the proprietors of certain skills and certain uh, things that we own, objects or tools or uh, time, right? We can sell our time in the form of wage labor, et cetera. And that is the prevailing conception of human nature, right. whether it is, uh, whether folks are aware of it or not. Yeah. Now that's not what I genuinely think that human nature is, but to your point about, uh, you know, fucked up societies mm -hmm. making fucked up people, uh, that that's, I think, uh, I think that's right on the mark. As I think about it, the key is the, is the shift from anthropocentric thinking and living to biocentric or ecocentric thinking and living. And yes. that, that for me, the shift to an ecocentric worldview, a life-centered worldview, uh, really does pretty much evaporate the fear of death. Um, right. and, and, and it really, I mean, I think it was G.K. Chesterton who said that the fear of death is the root of all sin. There's this sense of, of, of uh, with, with an anthropocentric worldview, with a human-centered worldview, where we're no longer life-centered. I mean, I use the word God, G-O-D-D-E, meaning life, life personified. You know, we're no longer life-centered, so we're human-centered. And then, of course, you're going to be afraid of death. And, of course, then it's all going to be about your own, you know, self-centered stuff. Our instincts the way I've been thinking about it lately is that it seems to me that our instincts are just as compelling as any animal's instincts. Yet our instincts only serve us fully when we're in ecocentric, life-centered, um, pro-future societies or cultures. When we're in anthropocentric, mm -hmm. human-centered, uh, anti-future cultures, those same instincts cause us some real problems. Yeah, they're maladaptive. Uh, yeah. You know, we're not supposed to live like this, in other words. Uh, the Industrial Revolution in particular is like uh, less than a blink of an eye in human evolutionary history. And now we find ourselves, you know, I, I experience this in a very embodied fashion every day of my life here in Manhattan. I'm in Manhattan in New York City. It's a fucked up place. It's incomprehensible. No one should live here. Uh, like, it's a nightmare of epic proportions, yet it's also, I love it here too. Uh, and it has provided exactly. me with amazing opportunities. And, exactly. but, but to your point, it's just like, this is, this is a bizarre time to be alive and we have to almost pull ourselves out of the, that matrix yeah. <laughs> and it, reconnect with uh, what really uh, makes us happy and whole and those types yeah. of things. Yes. Well, and that actually makes it easy. I mean, for me at least, it's I find it fairly easy to be a full-throated, big-hearted yes to life on life's terms as it really shows up, including the possibility of human extinction in the not-too-distant future and certainly right. difficult times ahead. Um, to be a full yes to all of that. And part of that is the ecological worldview provided by William Catton and, and others, but his masterful book, Overshoot, which as you know, because yes. we've talked previously that, you know, I consider the most important book I've ever read in my life, as does Connie. Um, yeah, it's, it's up there for me too. In fact, it's on my shelf somewhere. You can see the yellow spine. I can see right? the, yeah, exactly. I see the yellow spine, right, exactly. So anything you want to say about how, how your worldview has uh, shifted, grown, evolved, whatever. Um. Yeah, there's, there's a ton I can say about that, I think. Uh, you know, first, I guess I can locate myself uh, temporally. You know, I was born in 1988, so I'm a Reagan baby, right? Uh, and the, that is, for me, the 80s represent and, and were the ascendancy of neoliberalism. Uh, and neoliberalism, in my view, is is the expression, is at least one major political expression of what I what I think uh, Greer calls catabolic collapse. Right. So it's the beginning of the withdrawal. It's the it's the move. Not that this wasn't already the case under capitalism broadly, and just a rapacious human species generally, uh, but the move more. Uh, more cruelly, really, towards an extractive economy that is just ripping everything asunder uh, and, and with total disregard for especially the human and animal uh, cost to those activities. 
Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I, that for me was very, was not a distant uh, or an abstract thing. Like, like I had mentioned, I was born in a rural Western Pennsylvania coal country. You know, there was a, uh, the, what's known as the, I think the Homer City power plant was visible from my high school, one of the largest power, coal fired power plants in the country. Uh, and so I was in the shadow of that my whole life. I, I lived in a small town that was contracting, that was experiencing this very viscerally, although I didn't realize it. In many ways, I did have, you know, uh, youthful innocence, right? Uh, I went to the ice cream shop as a kid, et cetera. I, I had no idea, but uh, walked around town with my friends. But at the same time, I could feel it. I could feel it and I could see it. And, and as I grew older, it became clearer and clearer, especially for me. And I think this is, uh, is common to many folks in my generation through the opioid epidemic uh, and the increasing volume of sort of deaths of despair and what I recently saw called as uh, shit life syndrome. Uh, shit life syndrome? Shit life syndrome, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and that is exactly what it sounds like, you know, you, when you are, when you have no avenues for social mobility, you see businesses closing down around you you see homes being foreclosed upon on your street etc cetera, etc cetera, and you uh turn to uh palliatives uh and unfortunately one of the major palliatives that has been pushed on us as we must remember a an, again an expression of neoliberalism is opi the opioids opioids did not become popular by accident they were pushed deliberately by corporate ph pharmaceutical corporations uh incentivizing doctors to over prescribe them uh and uh, fighting uh you know alternatives like the legalization of marijuana which might produce a, a healthier way for having a, a gentler shit life exactly anyway you know i i mention all of this to you know I, it, it touches me personally just just last year, uh, or in fact, it may have been late, it was t late 2018, uh, my, my younger cousin died of an, of an opioid uh, overdose. You know, it's, uh, and he was 25, you know. So, and I've had other family members that have, that have struggled with this in a very real way. So yeah. anyway, uh, that, that's the milieu that I came out of. And so I was angry. This is something I've realized about myself as I, as I recovered from some of this trauma was just that deep anger that was un, sort of undirected. It was just angry at everything because I had experienced political, economic, social, every type of oppression you can imagine, uh, essentially, without really realizing it. In an historically oppressed region, Appalachia, which uh, does not get enough attention or, or uh, sort of clout in the sort of oppression Olympics that so dominates our identity pol politics today. Just not to say by any means that, you know, I certainly haven't su suffered racial discrimination. That's one way in which I have had privilege. Um, but at any rate, that, that, that shaped my worldview from the start. And that anger, that anti-authoritarian disposition the recognition that the evangelical Christians that I was surrounded with, for example, the Republican politicians that so dominated my region were my enemies. Whether they themselves knew it or not, I think many folks lack class consciousness and are themselves oppressed, hurt people, hurt people, that kind of cliche. Mm -hmm. But, but that, uh, that desire uh, to sort of overthrow <laughs> these oppressors had imbued me with a revolutionary worldview from the get-go. Yeah. Uh, I remember turning against, I remember telling my stepmother, who was an a evangelical Christian, at roughly at age 14, I was like, I'm not going to church anymore. And what made me do that? I spent some time with a pastor at a church camp 
studying uh, the Nicene Creed and other things. And I thought this is not, this bears no resemblance to my, to what the so-called religious folks around me are doing and thinking. And I'm not going to countenance it any longer. So turned against that, turned against a series of things that led me to becoming, which I had always already been, what I later learned uh, in my philosophical studies, the ancient Greeks called it atopos, uh, which just means out of place. Uh, Socrates is often, is often called Atopos, uh, and he's the paradigmatic figure for this type of life where you just don't fit in. Uh, you don't fit in with the, the, the norms, the prevailing thought ways of your uh, community and your time period. Nietzsche called it being untimely, untimely. And, uh, and that, that has colored my perspective on things from the start, but that, that became sharpened and more uh, concrete as I learned and grew and did that inner work uh, of overcoming my trauma, struggling with it, being, you know, uh, being a type of person that I didn't really like, but didn't know how to be better than for a long time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, uh, and, and suffering, it was suffering, ultimately yeah, suffering yeah. And, 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 and unfortunately hurting others along the way. Uh, but eventually you make that turn. And I made that turn, uh, you know, to, in my early, early 20s, I think, is when it started. Uh, I, had, I had just had a lot of shit come down on me. And I will share with you something that I don't share with many people. And I'm comfortable acknowledging that perhaps thousands of people will view this. But I, I had made a suicide attempt in my early 20s. Uh, and it was... It was more in the call for help, cry for help camp than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was nothing to yeah. uh, downplay. Yeah. And that for me was a real, that was a brush with mortality that I think a lot of people don't experience. Yeah. And that had an important effect on me. Sure. Anyway, you know, I struggled with that. I, I uh, grew from that and came out the other side, thank God, as a result of, uh, some su some key support, especially from my mentor Jack, that I've mentioned before. Uh, and at, at any rate, that was that was a turning point for me, a crisis in the real sense of that word. Crisis means turning point. You probably know. Yeah. And uh, and and from there, as I say, I, I began to study and really become who I was in Nietzschean terms. Nietzsche says, "Become who you are." And, uh, and that was my opportunity. So I'm grateful for that experience. But I mention it also not, not just to give, you know, my, my personal account, but also insofar as I think that near-death experiences broadly construed can be and are a, a major and deeply profoundly impactful way or method by which folks can arrive at, at, uh, at this kind of understanding a post-doom what you're, what you're calling a post-doom awareness right yes, uh, yes. real grappling with your own mortality and coming out the other side and and there's a sense in which i consider almost all my work especially my sort of pedagogical or psychologically informed work as facilitating something like a near-death experience in people yes. so that 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 is less dramatic you know it's less dramatic than what than what I and perhaps you and many others have had to go, go through. Uh, but it's like, let's, let's uh, gently guide people in this direction. Socrates would call it midwifery, myotics, you know, birthing a different, uh, different type of consciousness. So anyway, maybe you can redirect me now because I feel like I'm rambling, but well, I hope that was- Actually, uh, one of the things I appreciated about your first essay that, you know, We Are the Threat was exactly that, that, yeah. that you were providing a, uh, the reader a near-death-like experience, um, or yes. at least a consciousness of that and a mortality and how that can be so foundational to a worldview that can truly be soul-nourishing without in any way denying reality right a living death uh is one way that i put it sometimes without the negative connotations of death right yeah 
Uh, well, Roy, Roy Scranton in his book, uh, I forget if it was uh, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene or uh, We're Doomed, Now What? But in one of those, right. he talks about having been on the battlefield and basically the only way he could function and it's served his life since then is to assume he's already dead. And when you're right. so with your own mortality that you know that you're going to, you know, you know, your days are numbered and you're really at peace with that, then you can live fearlessly and um, on purpose from a place of, uh, well, for many of us, compassion, generosity, where we can make a difference. You know, stoic thinking has influenced me as well. Yes. Marcus Aurelius writes uh, at length in his meditations about exactly that, you know, imagine yourself to be dead already. Uh, you know, uh, and, and all you've got left is, is, or, or is what you've already done. Um, but, but you were, you know, and you were, when you were speaking, reminding me of something else that, uh, that it impacted me, uh, that was a film, uh, but, which I later read as a book was Fight Club. If you haven't seen it or if folks haven't seen it, there, it has this reputation as being what it's not. It's not just some movie about brawling. It's about this deep, grappling with identity and death uh and uh and there there are things there are near-death experiences in that film which i've used in uh in some of my writing and some of my speaking uh that touches on these themes so just throwing that out there for folks who yeah. may have missed that flick it's worth checking out yeah no i agree and i'm, and I'm glad that you uh mentioned that well Rory, I, I have a clear sense that we could talk for hours, and actually I would like to, but uh, in, yeah. in terms of winding this conversation down, anything that you'd like to share in terms of how do you stay inspired, what, what allows you, what tools, practices, exercises do you find particularly helpful in nurturing your spirit that allows you to wake up each day on purpose and, and uh, with good work to do and mostly to keep a joyous spirit in the face of you know catabolic collapse yeah yeah uh well you know yeah you reminded me made me think of george carlin there for a second is special from the early 90s where he has a whole bit about you know uh the planet is fine the people are fucked he says uh and he it's really it's it's really sort of collapse aware it's deeply he he was in touch with some stuff if you haven't seen that special you should check it out uh but, but I mention him not only because it's relevant, but also because I think humor is so key. Absolutely. Humor is key for uh, coping and, and flourishing uh, during this. And whether it's dark humor, if that's uh, your thing, some of it I think has to be dark humor, yes. uh, but just, but, you know, just humor in general, keeping things light and a really, because this I think is really important because people who have a, a post, this post-doom perspective are living what is sometimes called an ironic existence, I think. And like we have to, we have to sort of go about our daily business in a, in a world that, in which we do not fit. To harken back to what I was saying about being out of place or octopus. And there, that, that experience, that daily lived experience is, is just rife with, ironic joy i think and yes. and it puts you in a place where you can just let things go let things go that don't matter what are you in such a hurry for i see i, I have that experience a lot here in new york what the fuck are you doing <laughs> that you are in such a rush for that you have to be miserable you're making yourself suffer just recently, somebody turned me on to a video clip uh, with Bayou Kamalafi, where he says, the times are urgent. We must slow down. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. That's a great way of putting it. Because if you, if you believe as I do, and, and you do, and I think the post-doom perspective requires, that uh, ecological collapse, et cetera, during the Anthropocene is a, is a, is a fait accompli. It's already going to happen. We just, many of us just haven't realized it yet. That places you in this, in that exact position where you are confronted with how do you want to spend your time? Yes. And do you want to spend it in a way that is soul nourishing and things as you were saying or not? So for me, uh, really emphasizing humor, trying to thrive and dwell in that space of humor because it helps me to mitigate my anger, which I know still drives me in many ways. Uh, and also just deliberate 
living life deliberately in general, with, given that awareness. So uh, really uh, having a, a things that you care about and engaging with them wholeheartedly, uh, whether that's simply something recreational or something, something deeper. For me, physical exercise is also very important. Uh, it's something that uh, supplies an enormous amount of sort of uh, mental health <laughs> uh, yeah. improvement for me. Um, but also, you know, uh, engaging with folks like yourself, having these types of conversations. That's why I think this post doom series is so uh, unbelievably important is because it provides space for us to tell our stories, to connect with people who share similar understandings so that we don't feel like we're insane. Yes. Uh, you know, because there is this idea that if you aren't, that one way of thinking about schizophrenia is that is being outside of a shared community of mutual uh, understanding and experience. And, and without something like this, then, then we lack that. Yes. So connecting with folks. And again, for me, that's, that has taken a, a, the form of uh, involvement in Extinction Rebellion, a movement which in principle I deeply believe in, although in uh, its pragmatic expression has been problematic. Uh, but, but yeah, coming together and, and really finding a way to take action, even in the face of the tsunami that's crashing down on us one way or another. Yeah, yeah. And the younger folks in particular are really, I write about this, you probably won't remember because why would you, but I have a brief passage about this in uh, it, We Are the Threat, about how the youth are not going to be tethered to a, a system, including a population of persons, adults, older folks, who they rightly recognize as killing them. They're not going to be tethered to it. They're not invested exactly. in it. They'll resist it. They are. They already are. Uh, and we have to. I think folks like us, uh, people who are older than the generations that are coming up, that's where perhaps some hope lies for us. Not that the youth will succeed. They can mitigate, but for our own lives, I think we can. We have a choice. At least one choice. Are we going to help? We're we going to hurt or hinder. Are we going to are we going to help the youth? Are we going to move the trees? Are we going to educate and give them the tools that they need to adapt and survive and save 10 million instead of 5 million people or whatever it may be? But but that's where my hope lies yeah. in organizing and moving, uh, transferring that power out of the hands of those folks and into our hands, into the hands of people who have a post doom perspective or have at least a, a compassionate one. Uh, and, and I just do want to give a shout out to Extinction Rebellion for being at the bleeding edge of this, in my opinion, politically speaking. There, and I would highly recommend you mentioned some brief texts that really distill things down for you. And Roger Hallam, one of the co-founders of Extinction Rebellion, has a short uh, manifesto that he calls Common Sense for the 21st Century. It's freely available online as a PDF. Uh, you can email me personally. I'll send it to you. You can find it in bookstores or, or Amazon or whatever. And he lays out in fewer than 100 pages the pathway for direct political action, civil disobedience, nonviolent civil disobedience, to a place where we can meaningfully uh, form a new type of political community or communities that may extend to the global level and may give us a form or a, a way of coordinating human action here to produce something like uh, Robert, what Robert J. Lifton calls the climate swerve. I'm not sure if you've read that short book, yeah. uh, but for those who may not know Lifton, he's old as hell. He's like 90 something brilliant guy, has a long history of being an anti-nuclear activist, uh, and his, uh, what will probably be his last book is this climate swerve, and it's this idea that we are at this juncture where we go left or go right. We swerve out of the way of catastrophe and extinction, or to the extent that we can mitigate it, or we don't. Um, and, and for me, Extinction Rebellion is, is shooting up a signal flare 
uh, and saying, here we are, this is our banner, come together, hopefully, unite under it, it's a movement of movements, and let's at least walk in that direction. Let's, let's, let's move towards the climate swerve in a way that allows us to, to save the most life that we can, given the collapsing conditions that are exponentially worsening all around us. When I speak to boomer audiences, I often say whether you agree in every detail with young people in their vision and their, their stand, or whether you think that some of their hopes or dreams or expectations or wishes or desires are unrealistic or not, it doesn't matter. It's a moral obligation to stand with young people in their fight for intergenerational yeah. justice. Yes, it should be, right? And to many of those boomers, I'm sure they either don't understand or are immediately uh, resistant to that type of framing, uh, because unfortunately that the egocentrism uh, characterizes in many ways the boomer generation. Uh, but I hope, it's, I hope your message is getting through to some of them, teaching folks now how to live in the world that is likely to be. Uh, which is a big part of why I think education today, institutionalized public education is fucked. Greta sees this, right? And that's part of her whole message. Why should I get an education and take these standardized tests for a world that won't have jobs or a world that won't exist, et cetera? It's maladaptive, it's dysgenic, it's oppressive, dehumanizing, it's wrong, it's harmful. Uh, and, it's go it's, and we see that in the fact that it's increasingly carceralized Right, we have the school to prison pipeline, which disproportionately affects black and brown folks. We have white men, white, young white males, uh, conducting these mass shootings at schools throughout the country. Schools are microcosms of collapse in many ways. Uh, and I just mentioned that because I think, in terms of for myself and maybe for others, it, doing impactful work through, through education, I think. Uh, is is a major way of getting some sort of soul nourishment for yourself, certainly for me. Yeah. Amen.